Welcome to breakout session track four. Uh, my name is Tom Sue. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for CASE. Um, we are, have a panel here to discuss privacy um, and geolocation when everything's connected and to discuss the topics um, and mostly we want to take your questions. So let me uh, introduce the panel and then uh, we'll get started. Our moderator is Jonathan Enton, to my right. He's a professor of law and political science, constitutional lawyer mm -hmm. at Case, West Virginia, Case School of Law. Our second panelist is Ian Friedman here, to my right. Oh, oh, I have a bio. He's the principal of Ian N. Friedman & Associates, LLC, which is a Cleveland-based criminal defense law firm. He's the adjunct professor of law at Cleveland Marshall College of Law, where he teaches computers and criminal law. And he's the president of the Ohio Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. And to our far right is Raymond Koo, our professor and co-director of the Center for Law, Technology, and the Arts, um, a co-conspirator of mine in golf. And he's assisted uh, with a number of policies at the university. And um, I'm Tom. So um, what we'll do is uh, I have a brief set of slides to sort of set the posture, maybe set the tone for our discussion. And we have a number of questions that we'd like to sort of bring up, but we'd also like to really involve any questions that the audience will bring forward. So we invite you to step forward to the microphone uh, when Jonathan designates the time appropriately for you. Okay, well, um, I don't want to spend too much time with this. I do want to say one thing about Ray, which is that in addition to, uh, to what Tom said about him, uh, Ray is the lead author of the, the uh, leading uh, casebook on, uh, on internet and cyberspace law, which has just recently come out in the second edition. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Um, just want to set a, a couple of, of uh, 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 general things. I mean, uh, we know that uh, geolocation on the web is, is uh, pretty well established. Uh, we know that uh, lots of sites use uh, IP addresses uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and other things that uh, can lead to, uh, to uh, tracking down your location, uh, both electronically and physically. Um, there are a lot of laws that require uh, uh, information providers to maintain a lot of this information, and uh, entirely apart from the laws, there are lots of private entities uh, that, for various reasons, find it to their advantage to maintain this information as well. Um, and so what we're going to do in this session is, after Tom gives us uh, a somewhat more detailed overview of this with his slides, um, Ian will talk a little bit about sort of the uh, some of the legal issues that arise with some of these governmental uh, efforts to, to uh, uh, obtain uh, this information. And Ray will talk a little a bit about um, the private sector side. Um, and as Tom indicated, we'd like to, uh, to engage you uh, in the discussion as much as time permits. So uh, let me throw things back to Tom and we'll go. Great. Hit the space bar. Hmm, interesting. One more. One more. Okay, um, as a security officer, I have a lot of liaison with um, law enforcement, and, and especially in terms of uh, people breaking into things, oftentimes they will brag and tell you that they were there. Um, the reason why the dog is there with a fire hydrant is that um, we know what dogs do when they see fire hydrants. They mark their space. They say, I was here. The people tend to also tell you that they were here in one way or another from a location standpoint. So we like to sometimes tell that we've been there. So it's a part of sort of setting the stage for what really is expectation of privacy or security as well. Next. Um, additional ways that you see the people. I said they've been here. Um, this is not my house, thank you. <laughs> and another one. Um, at the Vietnam War Memorial, when I was in Washington just recently, there were people who like to leave little mementos that says, hey, I'm part of this, I'm connected. I was here. I don't know if you can see this, but um, I live near Little Mountain out on the uh, east, eastern side of Cleveland, and I've been hiking up there, and people leave marks. This is from 1877 saying I was here. Um, it was a really small place for people, uh, basically the wealthy people of Cleveland would go 
Um, some are up there, and inside on the rocks, you can find that I was here. Um, and the reason why I bring this is that where I was and where you were and where people will tell you they've been is a key when I was working at Progressive Insurance. We were running the telematics project, which would put a device in your car and it would tell, you, um, tell the insurance company where you've been and how fast you were getting there and whether you drove through the danger areas that we were tracking. It's a data-driven kind of business. That was ensconced in the customer saying, yes, I will give you that information, and we put a device in their car, and we would track where they were, basically when they started their car and when they ended. So we could actually give you, how would you say, usage-based insurance. If you weren't using it very much, your rear rates were lower because you were clearly a lower risk. So this sort of moved along to from the, we were in the first stages of this wave here of putting the equipment into cars. But now what's happening is Ray's got an iPhone, anybody's got a GPS, you've got a TomTom -tom in your car. Those location data is going somewhere. And that's what we really wanted to discuss about, what connectivity has changed. Location-based data is useful. Those of you who've been watching the news or working in pandemic flu questions so show that if I can put a map up that shows you where all the cases are, it gives us decision-making capability. So it's of great value. It's what the fidelity that we're thinking about is. Next slide. As the fidelity gets closer and closer, here you can see, this is from yesterday. <coughs> this is a flu cases of the H1, H1N1 that are in Ohio. Do I really want to go to the detail of saying there's a person sitting next to me with GPS that's been reported to have that virus? Obviously, you know, we, we're asked to quarantine ourselves if we're sick, but what if you don't? So those are the kind of stage I like to set. Um, and then we got a set of questions here. So these are questions I think of as a security guy. Do you want all the data about you, and what are your expectations? Technology, as it gets greater fidelity, can allow you to drill down a lot more, but you're also swimming in a sea of data. So um, we can see where the government fits in, and then we'll also frame the conversation around that. Cool. Next slide, or are um, we with me now? Well, that, with you. That, all right. yeah, those, those are regular questions on the last slide. Fair enough. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you. I'd just like to uh, begin by thanking my colleagues uh, here this morning and, and saying it's an honor to uh, be with uh, each of you this morning. This is a, um, an interesting subject, and although dealing with it for several years as a criminal defense lawyer, and I'll, I'll get into how uh, in a moment, uh, I really found myself a little torn when getting uh, ready for this presentation. Uh, the question being, uh, really, uh, is it beneficial to society? Is it detrimental? Is it uh, the same question applies to, uh, to my profession? And I will say that from a personal standpoint, uh, I have a problem with the technology today. Um, uh, the fact that we are tracked consistently, I think, is, uh, as we were just saying, you can't get away from it. Um, but professionally, uh, I have seen the technology work on both sides of the uh, criminal process. And again, I've got to speak from that avenue. That's my world. Um, we have seen now prosecutions uh, based upon geolocation and, and being able to uh, place individuals uh, certain places, certain times. Uh, and from a defense standpoint, we've also been able to, uh, although there's a presumption of innocence, at times we say that you've got to disprove uh, an allegation. And uh, so we have been able uh, to do that. Uh, I think that, and we'll get more into the specifics of it, but you know, as, as, <clears throat> as just alluded to, there is no getting away from the technology today and the storing of the data and who you are and where you are. Uh, if you bank, there are records as to the types of transactions you did, where those transactions uh, were conducted and when. Uh, shopping, if you shop uh, anywhere, shop online, the hyper-local advertising, uh, all of that information is stored in some database. Again, we heard about using the cell phone. Use a cell phone, we know exactly where you are and, and the GPSs as well. Uh, in essence, what we can do is completely recreate uh, someone's past route, uh, and not just uh, with basic longitude and latitude um, uh, figures, but also really getting right down to specificity in yards. 
And so the the question is, now we know that the government has all of this information, uh, but we're also going to get into the private sector momentarily. Uh, I guess where we are today is, yes, there are benefits to it, but there's a great danger. Um, in, in leading up to this presentation, uh, some of the individuals I spoke with talked about and questioned, you know, Orwell's 1984, and uh, are we getting there? And, and my uh, feeling is that I guess if the information were to be misused, the information is there. Um, the question also today is, uh, I think that what we've seen is, uh, or the question that begs an answer is, what is the expectation of privacy today? Uh, and, um, and I think that that's changing and everyone has a different idea uh, of what that is. Uh, the government, with regard to geolocation, as I see it, uh, some of the uh, laws that we have to deal with, uh, for instance, the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act was uh, brought in response to uh, the September 11th attacks. And uh, the Patriot Act, uh, particularly uh, one provision, Section 326, talks about uh, knowing your consumers. Uh, and that really dictates that, uh, and I, I'm going to just kind of give by way of example very quickly, uh, the banking industry. The government uh, is, or mandates that uh, the bank know their consumer. Um, it's an attempt, and, and suppose a valid attempt, to curb any types of fraud, fraudulent activity, uh, uh, movements of money, so on and so forth. Uh, but the problem is, whenever you have the government responding to new technologies, um, it is subject to abuse, and it is subject to, or opens us up to violations of people's uh, expectation to the privacy. So for instance, you do banking here today. You've got, um, the bank's got to do its due diligence, and that is the uh, term of art, uh, to determine uh, who that customer is. And as I said a moment ago, it's very subjective. Uh, the banks are called upon uh, to use a rating system of risk, uh, and so they are tracking everything that you do, everything, uh, when, where, and how. The subjective factors that a bank looks at when you're doing your transactions, the purpose of your account, uh, the actual or the anticipated activity, uh, the nature of your business, your location, the types of products and services you plan to use. So all of this is stored somewhere. Uh, and that is very problematic. Uh, now, some, most people don't know that all of this information is being stored. They don't know that if they go shopping, this stuff is being stored. But it's out there. And I guess that's where uh, I get concerned as to uh, the government uh, potential uh, abuse. Even though it started well, um, there are people that are being looked at uh, that are, uh, in their minds, would tell you that they should not be the uh, targets of investigation for terrorism and espionage. So uh, the law has advanced, uh, or is pushing uh, these entities to go a little bit far. And, and this is a, a short segment, so I've got to be rather topical. It is one example of many. And the fact is that your information is everywhere, so. OK. Uh, well, let me start with a little anecdote that will follow up on Ian's uh, talk there. And that is uh, about a week or two ago, it became publicly disclosed that uh, uh, Justice Scalia didn't think very much of data privacy. Right? He said, oh, you know, the fact that you can aggregate all this information about me online, it's publicly available, that's really silly. He, he didn't think it was a big concern. And he said this uh, publicly before a group of students. Uh, it just happened to turn out, turn out that a colleague of mine at Fordham who teaches privacy law uh, every year has his students engage in an exercise of how much information can we gather about someone and put together a dossier about that individual uh, just by the publicly available sources of information that are out there. And his students uh, picked, uh, as a result of Justice Scalia's comments this year, uh, Justice Scalia as the exercise. And they were able to collect 15 pages uh, worth of information about a justice of the Supreme Court, uh, including home address, uh, contact information, family, pictures of family members, and all of these things, uh, which led to a response from Justice Scalia that actually my colleague is completely irresponsible and unprofessional uh, because he ultimately violated his privacy, essentially. Uh, and so we kind of see there's this tension, right? I mean, uh, essentially with privacy law, and I think Tom Slide uh, does a uh, kind of perfectly illustrates this, right? We're often told that it's a trade-off between security on one side or uh, 
about the kind of the benefits of commercial technology and the efficiency of the marketplace uh, versus individual privacy. And I've argued, yeah, even before 9-11, that that's a false dichotomy, right? That essentially, at least from the government's side, right, when government is trying to look at our information, gather information, we, we want government to have uh, all of these tools, right? The question is how government goes about uh, engaging in that activity and that surveillance. And one of the problems that we get with privacy is that since the Supreme Court's decision in Katz, we have essentially have an idea that it's all about reasonable expectations. And that's all the 14th Amendment uh, really protects us against, right? And some of what Ian and both Tom have suggested is, obviously, reasonable expectations start to change over time. Uh, and as new technologies come on board, uh, the argument is we have less and less of an expectation of privacy, right? So, so the CEO of Sun Microsystems years ago, Scott McNally, said, look, there is no privacy. Get over it. And the idea being that we disclose all this information to people all the time. Uh, so the government's perspective has always been, so why not disclose it to us, right? Actually, we're doing all these things possible to, one, root out terrorists, and two, just catch ordinary criminals. Uh, so isn't that appropriate and consistent with the Fourth Amendment? Now, I've argued, and more people have started to argue now, that if you really think of the Fourth Amendment as a tool not about privacy, but essentially about power, uh, one that was designed uh, to protect individual rights and popular power as, a, as opposed to monarchical power, uh, we'd see it as much more of a tool not to protect privacy, but to protect individual security. And that's a security from essentially unfettered, uh, unfettered governmental power, uncontrolled discretion, and who government looks at in terms of its targets of investigation. And that dates all the way back to even before we adopted the Constitution. So the primary cases that are often relied on to say that there's a Fourth <coughs> Amendment concern over privacy, uh, while some of them kind of mention, at least in passing, some concept of privacy in terms of personal papers. Uh, the principal argument in all those cases was the fact that the government agents in those circumstances had unfettered discretion as to who to look at, when to look at them, and how to investigate them. Uh, and what's essentially happened is the Supreme Court's taken that area of law and turned it into one in where the Supreme Court itself essentially gets to define uh, when people have an expectation of privacy or security. Right? And <coughs> to bridge it to what the introduction said, I was going to talk about the role of private institutions, this is fundamentally important when we think about what's the current you know, battlefront of privacy. And that is not really government and individuals as much, uh, but the cooperation between government and private institutions. And so uh, we're talking about use of technology and collaboration and teaching. Uh, obviously, for us as educators, as university administrators, this is a fundamental concern. Uh, but we've, what we've seen since 9-11 is essentially the idea that if the government requests the information, or in many instances, even private entities, so the recording industry, the Motion Picture Association, uh, seeking to protect copyright, if they request the information, many institutions have a practice of turning it over. The idea being, uh, we are afraid of government penalties or the withdrawal of federal funds, or we're afraid of potential lawsuits and liability on our own for running computer networks. Now, I think that's, again, a major concern that we need to address as a community, especially as an educational community. Uh, we see from the telecommunications perspective that that isn't uniformly true, right? So while many of the telecos, uh, <coughs> in fact, did comply with government requests for information post 9-11, some of them resisted, even to the extent that, for example, Quest Communications saw that they lost out on government contracts as a result of resisting disclosing information that they believe were properly and, pr and appropriately considered private on the part of their subscribers. Uh, Verizon resisted recording industry requests uh, to reveal the identity of subscribers, arguing that the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which uh, uh, the RIAA was trying to use to get that information, didn't in fact authorize the disclosure of that information under the circumstances that they requested. Uh, and so what we see in those instances, now the, unfortunately those are the exceptions. Right? The, uh, 
many institutions are more than happy or not happy, but are willing to turn over this information. And the concern, again, is what kind of expectation have we created? What kind of relationship have we created with our students, with our faculty members, with our staff? Uh, and we often think of that purely as a function of, again, the government's Fourth Amendment reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, but there's something more to it than that. And it's essentially the relationships we've created. One is a matter of law. So when we have terms of use policies, uh, acceptable use policies, uh, those terms are going to be fundamentally important. And we're starting to see that start to play out. Uh, in the latest geolocation cases, the government's seeking cell phone uh, data location, right? So uh, as we see on 24 or any show about high technology and surveillance, or we can pinpoint people's location as a result of their cell phone location. Well, one argument has been it's not private, right? We give that to the cell phone companies. And unless you then take your cell phone into your house, which is a private area, uh, the government should be able to track all of that and gain access to that information. But with the pushbacks coming, and we're seeing quite consistently in the lower courts, uh, and this case will be decided in the Third Circuit at the highest level that we've seen it to date very soon, uh, is the idea that, in fact, the Computer Storage, uh, I'm sorry, the Stored Communications Act as part of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act actually protects this information. It's information that is subscriber information related to the data uh, of individual cell phone users. And in general, that act requires a court order uh, to reveal that information. Or the court can even decide that a court order isn't sufficient, that actually you need to have probable cause and the traditional issuance of a warrant. Uh, I raise this as an example of not only do we as individuals in this institution have to be concerned about privacy when we turn over this information, but that we as a, as a people in general have the ability to pass laws that protect privacy, right, regardless of what Scott McNally thought, uh, and actually assert our control over our information. I wouldn't say it's private in the sense that we tend to think of privacy as something secret, uh, but it's essentially autonomy over our information and the use of that information against, especially government disclosure, uh, without kind of greater reliability in, one, the information information they're seeking, or to accountability in terms of when and why they're seeking that information. Anybody want to jump back in on any of this? Uh, my inclination is to go to the, to, to engage you at this point and see if people have questions. If you do have questions, uh, because we're, uh, we're uh, being webcast or prepared for webcast, uh, please get to the mic uh, and uh, we'll take it from there. Hi, I'm Stuart Youngner <clears throat> from the Department of Bioethics. Um, th this is a fascinating topic, and you guys are talking about it at a very high level, and I want to bring it back to a more <laughs> mundane level. What is the university policy about monitoring people's internet use? There was a case recently, I heard this is a rumor, but it's a rumor that was announced at a, a meeting that a faculty member got in trouble for spending too much time on the uh, on pornography sites during uh, work time. And the, the, what I heard indirectly was that the problem wasn't that they were looking at pornography, but they were using a lot of uh, bandwidth and uh, they, should have, they should have been, they're getting paid to work, not look at pornography. But raises the question, it raised the question for me, who's, who's monitoring us? Uh, who is that a transparent, pro and I'm not even talking about what you give to the government, just saying what, what do you, the, the administration, what do you use? Who monitors you? Do you have to get permission to go look at people? Is there any transparency to that? And, and that's, that's a question pretty close to home, and I've never heard that. It seems to me that that ought to be pretty transparent, and, and, and we could complain about the policy, but I'd like to know what it is. The Maybe I should answer that officer. question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I had a slide on that. Yeah, that's about it. Um, it's, um, Stuart, the uh, acceptable use policy sort of drives the entire usage of network resources. Any of that use policy does describe monitoring. In specifics, it tells department administrators they're not supposed to be monitoring each other. And there's a there's a gray line there. So if you have a systems administrator, they're supposed to be looking at logs. They're supposed to be looking for things that have gone wrong, looking for attacks, 
looking for odd usage, much like what's described here as the bank know your customer. From the network standpoint, the network security team is the only group sanctioned to do that. So um, I monitor them, and they monitor the network. So there's just a couple people to do that, and they're using sp specific tools. Uh, the biggest piece we look for are network attacks, things that take down the network. Um, we have filters at the firewall edge that look for different things. Um, we do not have a university policy on content. Um, however, we're balancing that out with uh, RAA requests and media and things that are close to illegal. Um, and then there's an HR policy that talks about what's uh, ethical use of the IT resources and any resources. So in the particular case you're discussing, um, you're correct, it was huge throughput, and we monitor for throughput use. Um, it used to be a problem in the old days when we had 20 megs of throughput, and one person could take it all up, and then the internet would run to a standstill. Thanks to the network teams and the, uh, the, the throughput that we've got now, 450 megabits a second, um, it's pretty much invisible that that happens. So from an ethical standpoint, it's balancing out uh, what we see as um, large amount of usage and trying to encourage people to follow the pathway of what's described in the HR policy. Um, but uh, the other question that may bring up is, you know, how does the whole thought of, um, what did we talk about, Ray, um, faculty, academic freedom, does that fit in that case? And um, we're not quite, we haven't really come up with a, a big consensus on that, but um, maybe you could speak to the part about academic freedom. Well, I won't touch the academic freedom and pornography use in this particular case. <laughs> uh, though, though I, you know, th th there is always the concern uh, over one again: what are internal private policies? Right, and that's not subject to any constitutional restraints. It's subject to both our employment contracts, our terms with uh, the university, and academic standards. And so, uh, obviously, if it's a computer science professor, perhaps looking at the benefits of new technology and how it applies to uh, the streaming of online video, and they're using pornography as an example of investigating that, that might fall within what we would generally consider uh, to be appropriate academic freedom concerns. Uh, if there was a case about a decade ago involving a journalism faculty member who was looking at the availability of child pornography online, and uh, given child pornography laws, uh, the fact that he had even found any child pornography would subject him to automatic criminal prosecution. Uh, and uh, we could kind of look at it from those perspectives. Now, if it's just that you have a little spare time and you, you want to look at pornography, then that really is governed by the contracts uh, between you and the university. And that's obviously a concern. And th th what we're starting to see is an evolving sense of what the social norms are involving computer and network use and individual behavior. It's a couple of years, I think it was about a year or two ago, Facebook tried to change its uh, policies uh, and essentially allow instantaneous uh, access to what its members were doing, and especially for its marketing purposes. And the users of Facebook revolted. And one of my favorite quotes came out of that context was, uh, well, I expect my life to be translucent, uh, but not transparent. And what we're starting to see is this sense of, look, as a student or as an employer or employee, I might think that some of my activities are going to be monitored, they'll be available to, other, uh, to, to others. But I, one, don't expect it all to be. Uh, and more importantly, I don't expect it all to be used against me in some other context, right? So again, in England right now, I think it's England, uh, a woman was fired from her job because uh, she claimed to be sick that day. Uh, she then went on Facebook and made a posting, apparently from her bed, she claims, uh, from, and she was fired, essentially, because the idea was, uh, if you were sick and couldn't come into the office, why were you on Facebook? And the concern is, is, is partly privacy, but again, and uh, this is where I suggest that it's kind of our sense of what we think is appropriate use that's going to ultimately guide this kind of inquiry. And in many respects, anti-discrimination law, right? Uh, laws uh, in controlling the discretion of employers, laws limiting the ability of housing providers to say, I won't hire you, or educational institutions to say, we won't admit you as a student, uh, are really probably going to be the future of, of this. Yeah. Oh, the one thing that I, I'd like to add, we, we kind of talked about the expectation of, of privacy, and, and what I'd like to do is just kind of bring the practical uh, approach to it, and what I'm seeing on a daily basis kind of on the ground. Uh, and 
the argument, certainly from the uh, defendant or the person accused, the person who may have had the pornography on the computer finds themselves, uh, the defendant says, look, in my, my, um, my privacy was violated. And we get into kind of the, the Fourth Amendment uh, assessment, as Ray was uh, talking about a moment ago. But I have to say that from a uh, practical approach, uh, prosecutors and defense, for that matter, are able to get this material relatively easy uh, through the issuance of a subpoena. Uh, you know, we certainly, I think that the right debate is whether or not it should be given over, and, and we follow all of the circuit cases in the U.S. Supreme Court. But I can tell you that down on Ontario Street uh, at the Justice Center, a subpoena will get you uh, any information that you need. Uh, about anyone. And so we have found uh, many times that, uh, I'll tell you, the first time that I really learned of geolocation uh, was when I had, and this had to go back eight, nine years ago, uh, two defendants uh, came in. They said, Mr. Friedman, we, we promised we weren't there. We were on the other side of town. I was with my father. I was with my grandmother. I was making cookies. I was doing all of this. I mean, these were beautiful defendants. And, and so we went forward and, and couldn't wait to tell the jury where they were. And the jury bought it right up until a representative of Verizon came in. Uh, and said, well, it would be difficult to be making cookies here and taking care of grandma here when the cell phones had them right here at this particular time, right next to the body, and so on and so forth. That was all gathered uh, by subpoena, despite my protest that it was a violation of their privacy rights. Uh, and, and I think Ray hit it on the head. Uh, you're going out on the public airwaves there, and I think that you're the way that it's being viewed, at least by the trial courts on a day-to-day -day basis, is that there really is a um, loose expectation of privacy there. Uh, the same way that when you go out on the internet uh, and you brought up uh, pornography, and, and this is obviously not a pornography summit, but what I say is, and, and I teach my class this, this is, uh, I think it's been the training ground frankly, uh, for a lot of the investigative techniques. And it's also taught a lot of the defense lawyers uh, how to do this. And I say that because uh, the pornography, uh, we've seen it. You, you read the newspaper, you turn on the television. Uh, pornography seems to, uh, it's, it's in epidemic proportions today uh, if, uh, by media. And we know that the government is funding it through uh, 2013. There are grants that are going on. And, and so what's happened is, um, there are different ways of getting it. We now see people uh, through work, um, as you had indicated here, Case, and, and, and I've represented plenty of people uh, that have had their computers looked at. And so most of these people today are coming at us with, with these types of prosecutions. Um, and you had asked a second ago um, that it kind of be brought down into uh, the late terms. And the query really for us becomes, um, was this a private institution? Was it a public institution where there would be some type of government involvement? And that's really what would trigger off the Fourth Amendment. Uh, I've had people come in and say, well, my boss went through all of my stuff and he found evidence of this crime, whatever it may be. Um, but that was my stuff and I had my password and it was uh, within all of, you know, it was my file. I feel violated. It's, it's, it's a privately held company. There's no government uh, implications there at all. And the Fourth Amendment doesn't detach there. So the best that you can do to them is say, well, you may have civil recourse against them. But what type of case do you really have if you lose or if you're prosecuted in the first place for, some, for contraband of some sort? Uh, so uh, that, that's the big difference. And I wanted to make that distinction, because there are two totally different ways of looking at that. Stuart, let me make one, one other uh, comment. Um, it, Tom did not mention I'm also Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in the law school. Uh, and um, I think you should, not, uh, you should not underestimate the technological incompetence of most of the administrators around here who, even if we wanted, even if I wanted to monitor what Ray is doing, um, I wouldn't be able uh, to do it. And I suspect that that's probably true. I mean, I, if you happen, I mean, I don't want to make light of this. I mean, just more generally, you know, I, I uh, like to say that if you're in the numerator, uh, it doesn't matter how big the denominator is. Uh, I mean, if you happen to be the one who, who gets nailed, it may be small consolation that I'm a technoclutz, uh, and maybe by the purest of dumb luck, manage to figure out uh, what strange stuff Ray may be doing in his office on the other side of the building. Well, let me clarify the 
and from a user of the data, we monitor devices. So we monitor machines, we don't monitor people. What really the gap will be, and also with Verizon in this particular case is, was that device in the possession of that person? So when we look at odd problems, or we see you know, bandwidth utilization that leads to some other kind of investigation, still the gap needs to be made who was at the keyboard, who was doing it at that time, because we have the logs. <coughs> the real question is, is this a sea of data there as well? The only real way to tell is if you actually had secondary or tertiary evidence that said that person had that device at that time. And that's still a major gap. So from the university standpoint, in, a, in internal policy, and actually even as a maybe an ISP, I need to kind of know where the devices are. There still is a gap to prove that a person, a particular person, and were we certain that person at that time had that device, which locates it. Other questions? I'm not as tall. <laughs> Move the mic. Uh, and then I'll break it, it's okay. All right. <laughs> um, Jessica Walters here at CASE, and you guys have really touched on a lot of mobility. So um, from a government pr perspective, I know that they can find where you are and track where you are, and I, I'm sure that you guys know exactly what I'm doing, right? right? Unique story. Privacy users getting out mobile spyware. For $70, I can go out on the internet, download a program on my phone, and all you have to do is give me your phone number and I can track where you are, listen to your phone calls, listen to your text messages. What are the laws around that? How come that software is available that I can monitor anybody, get interrupt all of their phone calls, voicemails, text messages, everything for 70 bucks? What do you say to that? It, it's a very good question. Um, and I'm gonna draw upon a case from a gentleman who came in yesterday at 4.15 uh, to my office. Uh, his program was $114. That's uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> For $114, he uh, was able to access uh, a woman's uh, email account, and everything. Um, he is now the subject of a federal indictment, all right, for the interception of wire communications. Uh, the problem, his bigger problem, I should say, he figured, you know, if she finds out, she'll be mad at me. What he didn't realize was that when she opened up her emails from the hospital that she worked at, uh, that then um, uh, jeopardized all of the security for that hospital. Now it's really turned into uh, an ugly situation. Uh, there is a federal law that does address that. And, and so those software companies uh, and the applications that you're able to download, it's just, I guess, where are the resources? Does the government have the resource to go at all of those levels? And that's the problem. Because if they can say, well, there's a legitimate purpose to it, and there's a colorable argument there, I think it makes it very difficult to go after them. You really have to go after the Ill illegal usage of it. Uh, so it is there. Uh, is it caught often? Probably not. Uh, and, and only after uh, someone would probably see a security breach and, and be able to backtrack uh, on that. But so I just wanted to answer that because we, we dealt with it just last night. So, you know, as Ian says, I mean, th that's a violation of the law, right? I mean, the, ever since we had wired and then wireless communications, uh, Congress has made it illegal and the states have made it illegal to intercept these forms of communication. Uh, though, as Ian suggests, uh, you never have 100% enforcement. And so uh, especially with uh, the internet, it's, va it's easy to make all this kind of software readily available and distribu distributed virally and then almost have no responsibility for it afterwards. Uh, and that's why you see there is a deliberate pushback right, and a concern on the part of individuals ab about these issues. Now, the greater I I'll tie this into a, a greater concern that we might see coming up is that the Supreme Court in its last kind of surveillance case uh, came up with a rule that said that we essentially have to have the level of privacy that our founders would have enjoyed, right? And uh, which was pretty good because in the sense that the, you know, the founders didn't understand any of this kind of technological surveillance, that meant we had a lot more privacy. Uh, they then had one exception, however, and that is when the technology is in general public use then we have no, no longer have any reasonable ex uh, expectation of privacy, right? So the, the fact that a flashlight can be bought at Walmart means that we don't really have an expectation of privacy that police will use flashlights in looking into our cars. Um, 
the concern becomes when software like that is widely available, will the government try to say, even though it's illegal, it's widely available, so now we don't need to follow uh, Title III uh, and the wiretap laws. So we don't need to get a court order or a subpoena, which, as Ian suggests, is very easy to get, um, because there's no longer any reasonable expectation of privacy in it. Van Bray, also from Case. I'm um, afraid we're bogarting the microphone, but um, <clears throat> excuse me. I've always operated on the assumption, and maybe you'll dispute this, but I think I'll still operate on the assumption that the uh, the moment that I am on my employer's property, I lose all rights of privacy. Um, and um, I teach a lot of people uh, from a, at another program that I work at who are new to computing and have no technology ethics whatsoever yet in place, that this is a great assumption to work by because uh, over 30% of companies last year report having fired somebody for inappropriate use of their technology. And I believe that it's about 60% now report that they monitor their employees' activities online. So. Um, is my assumption, well, I, must, I think it's a good assumption whether it's true or not, <laughs> but um, is it accurate, number one? And number two, uh, carrying this a, a step further, how, what's the implication for privacy for our students when they're using a university network? So your, your assumption's a good working assumption, right? and, uh, and it, it, will, it will allow you to avoid pitfalls that could easily be avoided. Uh, the, the case law is split. There, there are some areas that the law will say, you know what, even though it's an employer or a university, uh, that kind of monitoring is just so beyond the pale uh, of an invasion of what we might consider to be dignitary interests that that would be a violation of privacy. But in general, as I said earlier, no, the, the truth is we're governed by the terms of use, the acceptable use policies of our institutions. And so if anything, it is read those documents a lot more carefully. Uh, and uh, to the extent that it's something students care about and we as an institution care about, we, we need to put a lot more thought into what goes into those terms, right? Obviously, as an academic institution, uh, we probably care about the issues about exploration and freedom uh, of thought in a lot more significant manner than an accounting firm would. And we need to build those concerns and those values into our policies and make them available. <coughs> right now, I always joke when I teach internet law, that how many, every one of you has clicked through the I accept, I accept, I accept policies uh, online, and one of the things that we need to change is the assumption that people have that I will just agree to whatever the terms are without actually looking at those terms. Very quickly, your assumption is right in line with the advice that I give uh, folks who come into the office uh, and what I would tell my students as well. Uh, if you don't want it out there, don't put it in there uh, type thing. And, um, just assume, you know, and I agree 100% uh, with the way that the courts are split on it. Uh, but to be safe, there's no sense in, in, in taking a chance with it. And so I tell all of our folks, I say, well, can't I do this at work? I say, no, don't. Just wait till you get home. So that, that's, that's my safe advice to them from a legal aspect. Okay, we have time for one more question. Marv Schwartz from Case, and um, my question is, why should the government mandate capturing information, having ISPs capture information, which if people were able to access would constitute a violation of privacy for the individuals whose information was captured? I mean, it seems to me that what you want is never even capture it. Uh, that, that's, that's a tough question. It's. Uh, it's not the I, best question to end on because yeah. we could probably go for the rest of the day on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my, my answer to that is I wouldn't. Um, but uh, the government is going to state that it is for good purposes, for law-abiding purposes, protecting the community, protecting its citizenry. Um, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a tough question here. You're, well, you're, especially from the government standpoint, let's say that the general population decided to use a Web 2.0 type, type of capability. I mean, this is about co connectivity. You snap a photo at a soccer game of somebody and post it on Google Photos or YouTube with a video, 
you know, say somebody coach arguing with the referee, is that that's a public arena, right? And now you've made it a global public arena. So workspace and what's public is really the boundary that's really hard to follow through on that. So if I stepped out of my house, am I private anymore? If someone's out from the press is taking a picture of me walking out of my house. So you, it's really hard. I'm, I'm saying that the boundaries are actually sort of fusing and fuzzing. You can't tell what's you know personal closed space and what's public space anymore. So if the government's in the gov public space and the information's in the public space, um, I'm, I'm inclined to agree that they're going to go get it if they need it. This is um, this topic that we've addressed this morning. I think is really just a phenomenal topic. It's it is the way of the future and. There really is no absolute correct answer. And we talk about uh, all the, the different circuit courts and, and the Supreme Court, and we're going to have to wait some time. There's so many different aspects of our lives now that are affected by this. Um, but again, just here, locally, uh, the problem with new technology, or just any advances, period, is that you have such inconsistency with the law. And every judge treats a situation differently. Uh, and so that, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how this all uh, plays out. We've got 34 judges here that represent our common pleas jurisdiction. And I can tell you that if you presented the same uh, fact pattern, you probably would get close to 34 different decisions as to what privacy is, what should be disclosed, uh, and how it should be disclosed. So it's a, it's a very interesting topic. And uh, with that. Oh, I get the final word. Well, one uh, data, data retention policies are the kind of new uh, one of the major battlefronts right now, right? And obviously, uh, private companies and in institutions are resisting it, right? They don't want the additional obligations of having to store that data. Uh, but you can see uh, from the perspective of law enforcement and the public, right? If if we keep two years worth of data and that helps us find a pedophile or that helps us find a murderer or you know have, uh, or a terrorist, we would want that information. So for me, the the concern isn't data retention in general. It's, again, what steps will the government need to follow or what steps can employers then use in order to get access to that data and then kind of use it against individuals. And, and so it's more important to con kind of constrain, constrain that uh, unfettered discretion than actually keeping that information. This is the first session on a very long conference. We have already run over a couple of minutes. Uh, as I said, we could probably stay here all day, but I want to thank my my co-panelists and wish you all a terrific uh, remainder of the collaboration summit.